Thank you for having me here. <clears throat> and Yossi, I know you've had a very tough few days. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, when Yossi told me about this in Israel a few, week, a few months ago, I was very interested. I thought it was just a people, bunch of people who got together and spoke to each other. I didn't realize it would be so formal where I'd actually wear a microphone and something on the big screens. It's very exciting. So I head the Consumer Electronics Association. It's a trade association in Washington, D.C., which uh, represents over 2,000 technology companies. Everyone you would think of from Google to Microsoft to Sony. And we just produced uh, two weeks ago the International Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. And that got 160,000 of our closest friends, uh, including about 40,000 people from outside the United States. It had 3,100 exhibitors in over 2 million net square feet of exhibit space. It's the largest event of any type in the world, we believe, and it's definitely the biggest thing focused on innovation. In fact, innovation is what defines the show, and innovation is what I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about. Why, I uh, love attending this conference, and I love a lot of the discussion focused on innovation, because the question that I have heard asked is, why is innovation important? And we've asked ourselves that as an organization many years ago. And when we decided that innovation is not only important for the process and progress of humanity and for moving things forward, but it's important from a governmental perspective, and here's why. Almost every government in the world faces the same set of challenges. And that is they want to spend more money on their citizens than they have revenue. In the United States, this has been a very big focus. How do you deal with the fact that we're spending more money than we're taking in? So you have a choice. You could raise taxes, you can cut spending, or you can grow the economy. And growth comes from, economic growth comes from trade, especially exports, and innovation is what fuels almost every aspect of growth. And that's why innovation as a strategy for a country, a government, a business, or even an individual, frankly, is a really, really good thing. And we started looking at what does innovation come from in a national perspective? Why are some countries innovative and others are not? Now, my focus, honestly, is the United States. But I've written two books on innovation and over 400 articles in the last three years. Uh, the book I wrote last year was called Ninja Innovation. And Ninja Innovation is how companies, people, and governments can be ninja innovators. And the book I wrote three years ago was called The Comeback, How Innovation Will Restore the American Dream. And innovation is something that I talked about in the policy context and also in the individual and corporate one. And what does it take to be innovative? Now, because of these two books, which have done very well and are in different languages at this point, I've gone around the world and I've talked to governments and I've talked to people and I realize that every country wants to be innovative. And especially European countries, what they do is they spend a lot of time and money focused on innovation as this big government strategy where big papers are prepared and there's big lengthy strategies of government doing all these things. And frankly, that is not the best way to be innovative in my view. I view innovation as something which is cultural and it's inspired by a number of things. One is, and this is what government can do, is can create an investment climate of risk where risk is encouraged and rewarded. And that has to do with tax policy, has to do with economic policy, and it has to do with how you treat those who do well who make money. Is it encouraged to make money or not in a country? Then there's the cultural issue of, of risk. Is it okay in a country to take a risk and to fail? In the United States and in Israel, there's two cultures which are very pro-innovation. And if you want to measure innovation by the number of patents granted per thousand people, Israel and the United States are the two most innovative countries in the world. But both countries do have a culture of risk-taking. Uh, Yassi was kind enough to sit on a panel I had in Israel a few months ago, and I asked the question to these great panelists and great accomplished people about why innovation is something which is so uh, effective in Israel. Why is it that? And the answers were amazing to me. Uh, 
People talked about the fact when your life is threatened every day, what's the big deal about risking for a business? Others talked about the great Israeli education system, the mandatory military system which produces a certain type of maturity, the fact that students there are, are more mature and, and serious in how they approach uh, their courses. Yassi, of course, being the intelligent, funny man, he said it's all about Jewish mothers, uh, which the audience appreciated. But the, the reality is, is there's a culture of questioning, of always doing something better. I personally think the United States has done well in innovation because of its culture. It's the most heterogeneous culture in the world. Kids may not study and memorize and do well on rote exams, but they are taught at a very early age to ask the question, why? or why not? They have lemonade stands where they start entrepreneurial activities at a young age. They're always pushing the envelope and pushing back. Authority is not something which is really respected in the United States. In fact, it's always being challenged. It's almost the, the questioning way. It's the fact that it's an immigrant culture in the United States relatively recently. And it's the fact that the United States has also attracted some of the best and brightest people from around the world. And there's even a system of laws which encourage dissent. The First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States says that the government may not squash new ideas. You may speak freely. And while certainly entrenched business interests and the old way of doing things have great political lobbies, you always get your day in court and you're allowed to push back. It's a cultural imperative in the US. It's the reason that there are 200,000 Chinese students in the United States today. Because as good as China is at manufacturing, they're frustrated they are not innovating. And they're not innovating because everything is rote and copying and, and incremental. Well, the US, frankly, it's a breakthrough approach. So when I w look at what other uh, groups do, and by the way, it's just not Silicon Valley in the United States. That is a huge mistake. You could go to Seattle and you could see Nintendo and Microsoft and Amazon. You could go to New York City. Virginia, Maryland, Tennessee, Charlotte, so many other areas around the U.S. where there's this confluence of usually almost always a good university, university system. There's some money that people have made, and we heard about this yesterday from some of the speakers, about the fact that there are wealthy people investing in startups and giving counsel and advice, and a little ecosystem is created. Sometimes there's specialties. In Maryland, for example, it's the life sciences, which are really doing very well because of the presence of the National Institute of Health, as well as some great universities and a scientific community which feeds off itself, feeds off each other, allows investment, allows people to transfer jobs and move along. So when it comes down to innovation and what's really important, what we're seeing is Great opportunities, not only in Silicon Valley, but worldwide. Now, having just come from the international CES, what I was amazed about that really was the newsworthy story was not any specific type of technology. And you heard Greg the other day give an example of wearables and other things that, are three, uh, other things that were at the CES. But what you saw there was innovation in a cluster of many different areas. You saw in video, you saw Ultra HD and LCD. You saw, uh, you saw OLED, rather. You also saw um, wearables. You saw new technologies coming out which are going to change the world fundamentally. For example, 3D technology, 3D printing technology. So there's a cluster, there's over 30 companies showing printing which is going to be in people's homes, not only making things, but food and soon bio, uh, prosthetic devices, things like that. And you're also seeing this whole new thing based on one fundamental underpinning called MEMS, microelectromechanical systems. MEMS are sensing devices, accelerometers, things which show movement or positioning or even temperature. And these are uh, technologies like this one, which basically give you information about yourself. But the MEMS have changed, and they're, and they're in your smartphones and your tablets now. But whereas five, or five years ago we could do these things, but they were very expensive. You had to essentially replicate your smartphone in a separate device. Today they're down at the component level, and they literally cost almost nothing to manufacture and to sell. So very smart entrepreneurs are putting those together in different ways, connecting it, uh, these devices up with other things, doing useful things, and connecting to the internet, to each other. And that's why you have this explosion in new technology and innovation based on smart homes, Connected homes, connected things, connected self, connected cars, connected everything. 
So what I want to do now is ask Greg to come up to the stage. And he's going to ask me some questions, but I wanted to just give you a very quick 10-minute overview of the fact that innovation is good, it's positive, it can happen anywhere in the world, it does take the right cultural environment, and the CES is a great show to go to, and you're all welcome to come. And thank you, DLD, for having me. All in 10 minutes. Good morning. So you talk about innovation, and we're in Europe, and you mentioned the United States and Israel. What about the impact of innovation here and how we saw that at the CES show? Well, I have to say, when you attend DLD, it's a really good thing. Because as passionate as I am about technology and believe in technology, and you know, we could do this whole thing via technology, and we could have uh, a whole web-based conference and never see each other. I'm also passionate about the five sense experience, the fact that you have a conference where you have to establish relationships, you have to look someone in the eye, you have to understand whether you're going to trust them or not, and you have to, most significantly, you have to expose yourself to new ideas. And exposing yourself to new ideas, by definition, is a random process. It requires you to get out of your comfort zone and go to something different and listen to somebody different and, and be inspired and think in a different way. And that's what the DLD conference does so effectively and that's why it makes a difference. And that's what the CES is. It's, it's literally 200,000, I'm sorry, not that many people, but it's close to that, focusing on innovation in one environment. And that's uh, why innovation is something that's very positive, which probably has nothing to do with the question you asked me, but try it again. <laughs> well, you had this thing called Eureka Park, uh, which previous years was just a couple of a small vendors, small people showing a few ideas. This year, it was, it was tremendous. It was multiple halls of people, and a lot of people came from Europe. I noticed the whole uh, airplane load of people from France, for example, with very innovative ideas. Are we seeing that now building up in Europe as well? Yeah, so where is Europe in innovation? I, I have not been positive, honestly, on European innovation. I'll be very frank with this, audi with this audience. My views have changed in the last year, especially with regard to France. France had over 1,000 people at CES. They probably had over 60 or 70 companies exhibiting. And where France and Italy are two cultures that rely on the five senses for creating styles and fashion and food, perfume, things that are sens sensual in nature, the government structures there have not been encouraging of innovation. And not that you have to be encouraging to be government, but you shouldn't discourage it in terms of wealth creation, risk, or culture, culturally. And the government thinks that somehow the edict will come from Rome or Paris, that this is how you have to have innovation. That's not how it works. You have to encourage risk-taking culturally, financially, and um, otherwise. And we haven't seen a lot. Seeing this DLD conference and talking with some of the companies, I'm much more encouraged about what's, what's happening in innovation. But it does take a cultural shift, frankly, and it takes work. And it takes a little bit of heterogeneity. Germany is obviously great in certain areas. And you always have to figure what your strengths and weaknesses are. Germany is precision engineering. It's the ability to get things done, make things happen, have the ships run on time. And, and, and that allows a, a tremendous amount of innovation. The automobile has become, in large part, the engine of innovation now in so many different ways. And there's no question, seeing what uh, Audi and BMW and uh, Mercedes were doing at CES, and, and virtually every major car company was exhibiting something, talking about something, and, and on this path to the driverless car, uh, it's a good thing. I was joking uh, on, on Monday, on Sunday when I gave my talk on CES that you should rename it the Car Electronic Show. Uh, I mean, the, the innovation in automotive and connected vehicles was really quite interesting. It, um, it really it changed, uh, the, it, when you think about it, you, know, you bring your own device, and now your car is an extension of the devices you have uh, at home. Absolutely, the automobile in so many different ways. Now, we are heading on this path to the driverless car, and if you think about the driverless car, it has tremendous societal implications. We heard yesterday about the fact that there'll be less purchased vehicles and more leased vehicles, more vehicles on demand, but it also affects literally hundreds of millions of jobs, drivers. And it's obviously great for people that are disabled, people that are older, people that are drunk, um, it certainly will change society, but we have to think about the ramifications. I mean, the reality we have to face as an industry is what we are doing in technology is fundamentally changing the world. But it's all, and creating great jobs for innovators, for creators, for people who can write apps, for people who can create content. But it's also going to fundamentally change jobs in the world. And it's going to cut down, most likely, on the number of jobs in the world. And that, we have to figure that one out, and that'll take some time. Having said that, it's just not about the automobile. Uber is a great automobile-based 
technology that will change the world, not only with regard to cars, but with regard to such mundane things, even as, as garbage pickup, for example. Uh, John Chambers of Cisco was talking at CES, and we heard uh, a speaker yesterday at a luncheon from Deutsche Telekom talking about the, how cities will change because of technologies. Well, you know, garbage pickup is something that shouldn't just happen on a regular basis. It should only happen when you have garbage, a full garbage can, especially on a commercial basis. That's a, you have a waste of vehicles and energy and money now being spent just picking up garbage every day on a schedule. Why is that? Shouldn't it be only when the garbage can is full? At CES, Verizon gave away $10 million in prizes, and one of them was to a company that created a solution for that very problem. With a wireless device inside every garbage can, basically it'll only send off a signal when it's full. And based on an Uber model, you could efficiently use the vehicles in that area and save a tremendous amount of money in pollution and things like that. And you could apply Uber to package delivery, you could apply it to almost anything, and you'll have a more efficient world. And our, our world, by the way, in the future will be Will you get your products to your home delivered by an Uber? Will it be delivered by a drone? Or will you make them with a 3D printer? This is the future we're heading towards in the next five or 10 years, your choice of delivery me mechanisms to your home. So changing the subject slightly, um, you were very passionate when you were opening up remarks at CEA about the uh, patent trolls and uh, the whole issue <coughs> of innovation being thwarted by uh, lawyers. And I guess you are a lawyer, right? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but but um, in all seriousness, uh, it, what's, what's holding back innovation? I mean, is patent, are patent trolls, is that, is that an issue that uh, you see that's going to hurt uh, the industry that we're in? Well, here's the deal. You can look at any country and say, here's a country's weaknesses and here's its strengths. The weakness we have in the United States is we have over one million lawyers, many of them looking for work to do. And we have a system of laws which encourages people to be sued, including startups and new companies, older companies, and then patents especially. This is not necessarily the biggest problem in other countries where, for example, in some area countries, you have a loser pay system. And we're fighting to get that changed in the United States. So whereas the U.S. is, is good in some things, uh, we're not good in litigation. We're not good in, in many other areas that European countries and other countries are much better at. I mean, here, the lawsuits are not the biggest problem in Europe. Uh, they are one of the biggest problems in the United States. And as part of my job is to get the laws changed. And we've gotten legislation through uh, the House of Representatives. Now we have to get the Senate to consider it. So... The other issue that's been uh, prominent here at DLD has been the whole issue of privacy. And uh, all these devices that we're wearing, our sensors, are all communicating. And where John uh, Chambers mentioned, you know, 50 billion devices connected to the internet, all talking, et cetera. Uh, where do you feel, I mean, how do you feel that privacy is going to be protected or does it not matter anymore? Well, of course, privacy always matters when you're the person whose privacy is being invaded and unwilling. There's three areas of privacy to consider. One is where the government any government, including the U.S. government, is asking, it's doing things you don't know about and gathering information on you. That's a, and that's what Snowden has revealed, and it's uh, embarrassing, frankly, to the United States. The United States, I think our citizens are mostly upset about it, because not only what we're doing to ourselves, but what we're doing to other people. And we think it's wrong, and I think there'll be action taken to curb that. The second area is where the government is asking companies to do things, and the companies like Google and Yahoo and others don't have a right to even challenge it, and they have to do what the government asks them to do. That, there's a tremendous movement in, the, in industry to change that, is to make sure that there's a process, as there is in every other area of law in the United States, where the government has, the company has a right to challenge it, there are clear standards, there's an adversarial hearing, and you, and you could push back. And the third area is how you deal with your customers. And that's what you're talking about. And that is, increasingly as we're measuring things, as we're sensing things from consumers, there's a tremendous amount of information flowing. And that is, everything must be, in my view, to be successful, there must be clear transparency, disclosure, and the ability to opt out of that information. Having said that, I think any person understands that to be better served, you have to give up information about yourself. The reason the internet is free is because you're giving information about yourself so people could figure out who you are and what you're like. The reason you go to a, a clothing store and, may, and tell them your size is so your clothes will fit well. You go to a tailor and you give up information. When the credit card was first introduced 40 or 50 years ago, it was, there was great concern about credit card information and what you buy and what you... And you know what? We got around that. People understood that there are risks, but there's a benefit from that. And I think we're going the same way. Having said that, we heard this yesterday also, the companies 
that establish a trusting relationship, whether it be an automobile or a service or a utility or, you, or a telephone company, they're the ones that are going to win. And there's a lot of space open for those to establish that relationship and become trusted. And that's what, those, that's what companies should be competing on the basis of. But it's always about disclosure and transparency and opting out. Well, thank you very much, Gary. And uh, I don't know if we have time for questions, if anybody I has any don't. questions. Yeah, we don't. According oh, we're to down the red light, we're red, down red to seven <laughs> seconds. But I will be available if there are other questions. I'd hate to set a conference off. And I do want to mention that there's a great new foundation that's been created for education. Zuzana is right here in the front, and she's focusing on getting people from uh, developing countries and other not the wealthiest countries to how their smartest students go to the best schools in the world. And this would be a really good thing. So talk to her. Thank you very much, Gary. Thank you.